I want to welcome everyone. My name is Mitchell Moss. I'm on the faculty of the Wagner School. And I want to say that we're doing this because several years ago, uh, the dean of the Wagner School, Sherry Glide, who's right here, had arranged for Eleanor to be a visiting scholar at the Wagner School when Eleanor was just beginning to work on the book. And obviously, uh, the book she's written, The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg, has become an important part of uh, political history and actually current political dynamics. And we're very glad that, uh, we're very pleased actually you're here today because it's an ideal week, as you know, because uh, he's had his presidential campaign. Eleanor is now able to comment on the campaign, the mayor's race. And I really want to say and respond to your questions. And let me just say, for those of you who don't know Eleanor, uh, if you've been following politics, uh, uh, she's been covering it since uh, she started the New York, uh, started with the Chicago Tribune when she covered the Carter administration. And I, I think it's important to know that she went from the Tribune to the Los Angeles Times, uh, Washington Post, and uh, was most famous for her spending time in Russia where she was a reporter and wrote a book about life in Russia. And I think uh, those of you who want to you know it's available on Amazon. So she has a background in international kind of politics as well as domestic. But we know her most in New York because for the past two decades she was the voice of the editorial board of the New York Times when it came to covering New York uh, before the New York Times editorial page decided to surrender their responsibility and make it kind of an ego page. And so it's gone from editorial to ego page. But this is important. Eleanor wrote the key editorial endorsing Mark Green for mayor in 2001 over Michael Bloomberg. So there's no question she's objective. There's no question that she's, you know, understands. But so that's how, you know, how much her influence weighed in that election. Um, thank God. So I just want you to know that we're very pleased because, one, this is an important book because it's not just about his mayoralty, about Mike Bloomberg's life from growing up in Medford, Mass. Can we get seats? Do you, we have some over there in the back. I just want to make sure. So we have some seats up here, and we have seats in the back. Over here, I want to make sure everyone gets one. This is terrific. And so here's our plan for the evening. <laughs> Eleanor has agreed to speak 15, 20 minutes about her book and about the mayor. Then we're going to have questions and answers. And I'm going to probably comment a little, but we want to encourage a discussion. If you're here, and this is just the perfect size because everyone can see each other and we have microphones, but then we're going to feel free to invite you to take a shot at Eleanor. And I really want you to know that. Any questions you have, and obviously this is a timely issue because we not only can talk about his role as mayor, but his role as a presidential candidate, and anything else that comes to mind. So I want to welcome you here, and I want to now introduce Eleanor Randall. Hello, and thank you for coming in from the rain. I, I, and I hope everybody here got at least two glasses of wine. That'll, that'll make my speech a lot better. Um, so um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, Sherry. Thank all of you. Um, so I did. I, I spent some time upstairs uh, working on this biography of Michael Bloomberg. And I just want to say, what I, since there are a lot of students in the audience, whatever you do, <clears throat> do not write a biography about a person who is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I, we decided, uh, my editor, uh, famous editor, Alice Mayhew, di who died recently, we decided that the title for this book would be The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg, but we had no idea how many lives that was going to be. So uh, I, uh, I mean, I can go through each life and, and tell you some of the things that I thought were funny or interesting or wonderful, but really, uh, uh, if you look at how he was a kid, you see the person who ran for off, ran for the presidency this last time around. First of all, his mom said he always wanted to be in charge. He always wanted to run things. And that was true. And it was true about being mayor and several people have asked him to be on 
boards of directors and he says, no, no, I'm not going to ever be on a board. I'm not going to ever be a senator. I'm not going to ever be a, a representative. I have to be the top person. And so it, it, so it made sense, even from the time he was like six, he was aiming in some ways to be, to at least run for the presidency. The other thing, uh, Mitchell and I were talking about this earlier, he, he loved, when he was a kid, he loved being in front of the microphone. And he was so proud you, um, when he um, got to, to make a presentation as a scout in front of a microphone. He loved that so much that you sort of see that carried through all these years, you know. Um, I think that's one of the reasons he left uh, his company to, to be mayor. It was much more fun uh, and much more interesting and much more important, actually, to be mayor of New York City and to be in front of the microphone every single day uh, than <coughs> to be the uh, CEO of a company, uh, a private company, that, um, you know, maybe there were a lot of people on Wall Street who knew about him and, and that sort of thing. But clearly, he still wanted that notice. So, um, so I, I, con I finished writing this book last March. And one of the reasons I finished in March was that I talked to Bloomberg and he said, I'm not running. Now, <clears throat> you know, um, so I'll add that along with my endorsement of Mark Green to the long list of things I've, <laughs> of mistakes I've made over the years. I believed him. I thought he wasn't running. And he said at the time that the numbers weren't there, and turns out he was right about that. <laughs> um, and he, um, he, you know, he just said he, he couldn't, he couldn't, really, um, he couldn't really do it. It just, although he had always wanted to run for president, always wanted to be president, uh, that it just wasn't there. So the, my book comes out in September. Six weeks later, he declares that he's running for president. <laughs> I could have killed him. And so, uh, you know, but as I said, if you're writing a book about somebody who's still alive, they keep moving on you, and especially if, if it's somebody like Mike Bloomberg, who, um, and, and Mitchell knows this, this is a man who cannot stand an empty hour on, in his calendar. He's, he, it, it just drives him crazy, and he's always been like that, you know? If, if, and you, when I think about our present mayor and the comparison, is it's really quite stark. Um, but uh, so, so running for president, he looked, I think he looked as happy as I've seen him in a long time running. At some point, he obviously wasn't so happy when they started getting the numbers back. But, um, but he... He, he loved being, that was everything, you know, you're running for president, you're out there. He, if you saw his tweets, he had so much fun antagonizing Donald Trump. It was one of his favorite things to do. And actually, that was a lot of fun, reading his tweets about <laughs> Donald Trump. And his ads, many of his ads, I mean, you know, so he spent nearly $600 million on ads, which is just, I don't, there are too many zeros in that to, to comprehend. But he, a lot, if you look at those ads, a lot of them are anti-Trump ads. And there's going to be a way they can sort of lop off some of the Bloomberg part of it and keep rolling those ads out. And that, um, you know, that will be, and, and we sh at some point, I, I know Mitchell wants to talk about how, how we move forward, but um, so maybe I should let you ask a question and stop rabbiting on. Well, thank you, Eleanor. So we, we well, there's your microphone. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Everyone have a seat. We have some seats back there. I just want to say. Uh, okay. I want to uh, make sure I can see There you one. go. 
Eleanor, let me ask a question which I think um, is generated by the past few months. Do you think that, did you ever think that his record as mayor would become part of a presidential kind of campaign and that, do you think that the record as mayor was kind of fully and accurately conveyed in this recent 100 days of campaigning? Well, you know, uh, Mitchell, you know that it's very, very hard for a mayor of New York City to run for president. And there has not been a great record. Um, Lindsay, did Lindsay get any delegates? I don't, I don't think he did. Uh, we've been trying to decide whether uh, Giuliani got any delegates. I, I, if he got any, it's probably one. Um, de Blasio ran, as you know, briefly. The thing about running as mayor of New York City is that we're a city that loves to complain. And, you know, if you look at the last election, the 2009 election, which uh, Bloomberg almost lost, um, over 500, like 530,000 New Yorkers voted against him. And when you think about that many people that have a complaint about a pre presidential candidate, you understand why it's so hard for uh, a mayor to actually actually um, make it over that uh, hurdle. As for his um, his administration, I think we heard he was busy telling his ads were bu busy uh, um, advertising how he managed, how he how he did, how he took control of the city after 9/11. All of that was true. He twice he brought the city out of, uh, helped the city survive uh, recessions, one of them, the Great Recession in 2008. And so, uh, and I, you know, I have a long list in, the, in this book of the things he did right and a sort of shorter list of the things he did wrong. It seems to me that the reporters who read this book only read that short list and so they focused on um, really his, his weaknesses, which were stop and frisk and the way he talked about women, especially in the earlier years. So since you mentioned this topic, I'm gonna follow up. Since one of the great changes in the United States, in the Western world actually, is the uh, fact that the issues about relating to the opposite sex, we're not part of really of the 2001 election, but they certainly are part of the 2020 election. <laughs> they are indeed. And so, you know, one of the, I, I, was it a surprise that this would be such a big issue? Is it the change in this country in 20 years? Is it, since much of this occurred really prior to being mayor while he was running a private company, I wanted to ask you, you know, the dynamics we have now that, you know, the kind of things that people did in public office would not allow them to stay in it today. So how do these issues that never really got to be in the front of the public agenda in 2001 come back so quickly in 2020? Well, you know, I mean, part of the reason is you have Donald Trump on one side and he energized so many women about how awful he was about women's rights and the power of women in politics. And then you had Hillary Clinton who lost. Uh, so many women felt uh, a kind of anger. I, you know, we, we all know it, a kind of anger that not only that Hillary Clinton lost, but that she lost to this sexist, you know, this really scary guy who had, who said some of the worst things about women that we've, heard in, in, in the public sphere. And so, um, so I, the one thing about Bloomberg and women is that um, he appeared to, to learn from his own mistakes. And you know, I have begun to think that is how you tell uh, whether a person is um, a worthy public figure. If they don't learn from their mistakes, they just, they harden in, in place and it's very, very difficult uh, for, for when the world moves uh, in a different way. So, well this, I'm gonna follow up then a different campaign issue then because obviously 
you know, the stop and frisk has become sort of the um, most frequently cited policy of the Bloomberg administration. And though I'm sure Richard Ruffo will confirm, the Supreme Court has said that stop, talk, and frisk has been approved by the courts, but another judge in New York said it had not been applied in a way that had been constitutional. So this was part of really a, the entire policy of the police department then under Ray Kelly and Bloomberg as mayor, and yet it never came to be such a dominant issue in New York. Was that a failure of journalism in New York? Was it a failure of the elected officials? But it certainly became a big issue in this campaign. But you would never know that that would be the kind of the signature of this administration until this campaign. You know, I think it was a big issue. I think people started uh, really recognizing towards the end of his administration how many people had been stopped and frisked. And, you know, one, one of the things I talk about, it comes up every time I give a speech, of course, and, you know, stop and frisk goes, um, goes way back. I think the first case was in the late 60s, um, Terry versus Ohio. They set up a system for stop stopping, questioning, and frisking people. And there were there are rules about how you do it. And it's still being done by the by the de Blasio administration and and in other cities as well. But what happened in the Bloomberg administration was that they were so focused on illegal guns that what they did was that they that they sort of let the police force loose to stop any kid in a in a higher crime area and and kids that had a coke bottle in their pocket were stopped and you know one of the things and I don't know whether Mitchell talked to him but I know everybody I interviewed him about this and I said you know, how do you feel about all these kids? And he's not a, he doesn't talk about his feelings very well, uh, Bloomberg. So we didn't, I didn't really get very much from him in that way. But a lot of people um, that are closer to him than, than a journalist like me kept saying to him, look, you know, this is, we know what you were trying to do, but what you did was uh, damage a lot of people in the process. So I was glad to see that he finally apologized. And I think that was uh, important for him to do, whether he ran for president or not. No, I mean, I think it was the, the, the court suits went on in the last term. I think that's correct against it. Of course, they, you know, the great irony here is that um, they challenge, you know, to the Bloomberg administration was one they could have settled earlier, much earlier with a judge, but they chose not to, which is, that, you know, the, the reluctance to make a settlement with a federal judge will always be something which you wonder Did you about. see what that federal judge wrote about Bloomberg the other day? He, this is Shira Scheinland. She said, uh, um, you know, Bloomberg, is, Michael Bloomberg is not a racist. And then she said that his heart was in the right place, but his brain seemed to be missing uh, when, it, in the, when it came to stop and frisk. And so she had ruled it as uh, unconstitutional. And if you read her um, decision, it really is quite powerful. Yeah, we should really give credit to this great public health professor, Jeff Fagan, who was the first person at Columbia School of Public Health to kind of identify the fact that this was really excessive with regard to where who was oh. targeted by this. You know, it started with the professor. That's all I just want to say. This Mitchell, I always learn something when I'm around you. <laughs> so, well, I want to open it up to questions if anyone has any because I can keep going. If you can identify yourself, that'd be great. I'm going to stand up so I can call you. So why don't we, I'm going to work both sides of the room. So why don't we start? Why don't we start? Yes. We have a mic. We have a roving mic. It's going to be a... Here you go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Craig Mills. I am actually an alum from Wagner 2005. I, I listened to your podcast uh, Sunday. Um, Mine? For the New Yorker, yes. Oh, for the New Yorker, yeah. And 
my questions are about Mike, uh, Mike Bloomberg's stop and frisk. I was actually stopped in 2011. I used to be embarrassed to talk about it. I still get emotional about it because I don't fit the profile. I mean, most ostensibly, I'm not a 20-year-old person. It was on, on Central Park West. And I heard you just mention that he apologized for it. But he didn't apologize until he decided to run for president because he originally said when he wasn't going to run that he wouldn't go on an apology tour. And so my question is, why is it that you think that he has, you know, he's apologized? I, I don't think his apology was sincere. There were many black people, as much as I loved what he did with public health, health initiatives, I was fully behind that, but I could never support him because I felt that he didn't really take responsibility for the things that he did. And I really thought my life was in danger the night that I got stopped, and I'm not exaggerating. Two unmarked men in an unmarked car jumped out of it and told me to get off my bike. I didn't know what was about to happen. And this was happening all around the city. And I don't think that he made real repercussions or even acknowledgments for what he did. And it's just, it's a deeply painful issue. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, um, you know, if you look at the number of people that that happened to, that is, that is one of the reasons that this issue keeps coming up again and again. Uh, I mean, he, he clearly thought he was, he was saving lives, and he talks about that uh, shortly after he left office in, in, uh, in vi not very um, appealing ways, uh, but, he, but that was what his focus was. He kept saying, I'm saving lives. He's a data guy, and when the data showed that even though stop and frisk had, uh, you know, that, that it's still being used, as I said, but not, not uh, to the degree it was with the Bloomberg administration, um, he and uh, Commissioner Kelly kept saying that the crime, crime would go up, that, that if you didn't do this, crime would go up. Well, it didn't. It didn't go up, and we've seen... Um, you know, uh, almost six years with the crime rate fairly steady, a couple of little blips here and there, but, um, but as, a, as a data person, he had to admit at some point that he was wrong about that. Okay, I'm gonna move it around. Can we just, okay, I'm just gonna go from, Hi. I, was, I was really struck by um, that you mentioned that the book contained um, lots of pages about things he did right and a smaller number of things he did wrong, but you were surprised that reporters focused on the smaller number of pages of what he did wrong. And um, since you were introduced as a longtime journalist, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the negativity of journalism and why is it that, um, that journalists and the media spend so much time You know, that is really a great question. And I have to say that uh, there's been, uh, I've had a sort of personal evolution. Um, I was a reporter for a gazillion years and then I was an editorial writer writing opinions. And uh, one of the things that happened to me while I was writing this book was I began to see <clears throat> how journalists are so busy focusing on what's missing that we miss the things that are going right and it's and what I realize is it's very very hard to write about th how things are are going well or how things are successful uh, or how hard people are working in spite of the fact that there's a failure for example so um so part of what I did in this book was try to give, I mean, all the stuff about stop and frisk is in this book, but it's, but I've also included all the, or a lot of the ways that, that Bloomberg put together a team to make the city better. And there are, 
there are really terrific examples of of things that he did uh, that that have have made New York City a better place to live for many many people. So um, as a result of that, since it's not a totally negative book, you know, it's and in fact, people sometimes ask me if I like him. I grew to like him. He has this very rough form of humor and um, you know and I have to say that it reminds me of uh, my days um, when I was covering Jimmy Carter and the and the bus you know all the reporters on the bus you really had to be tough to survive that he sort of and I'm sure it's the same kind of humor um, he's he, he's He's changed the nature of it a bit, but the humor is very much like uh, the toughness of Wall Street. You gotta. Um, so anyway, I ended up l sort of liking him, you know, and I respect what he's trying to do on gun control, on climate change, on, um, and I I do respect, uh, and, and we haven't talked about his campaign, but I but I think uh, I think. Somebody's probably saving up a question on that. Um, at any rate, I, he, I have tried in this book to write about some of the ways he was successful, not just the ways he was unsuccessful. You had a first, yes. Um, my name is Scott Kaplan. I used to watch you regularly as a panelist on uh, the New York Times Close Up. <laughs> and I'd like to ask. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were very good. Um, if he had been asked during the debates, should the mayor have apologized and would he have apologized for the illegal mass arrests in 2004 during the Republican convention while he was inside praising President Bush? And should he have apologized for the order to the NYPD shutting down Occupy Wall Street and separately any thoughts on who the New York Times will be endorsing now that their <laughs> two first choices have, are out of the picture? That's great. I, I want to say he gets the most efficient question, three and one. There's about eight questions in there. You can pick which one you can answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I mean, look, all the bad things about uh, Bloomberg was starting to come out. As soon as he reached 10% in the polls, you, you could see uh, his opponents starting to bring all those things out and, and you know, uh, uh, in, um, supporting George Bush. He was a Republican back then, um, so um, that was not totally surprising. But, um, you know, so th all that stuff was coming out and it was beginning to come out and it would continue to come out. Um, as for the New York Times, I have to tell you that I am not on the editorial board anymore, and so I have absolutely no idea what the next step is. I was as surprised as anybody that they supported two uh, people, both of whom are no longer running. Uh, so I would say, if I had to guess, I would say the Times will, the New York primary is April the 28th, so it, I would, imagine that the Times will come out again with an endorsement uh, before then. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Arlene Simmons. And before I ask my question, I'd like to tell everybody, Dr. Mitchell Moss was my advisor. Lucky uh, you. I have Yay. an MBA from Wagner. Uh, <laughs> my question is, when you were uh, doing your research on Mayor Bloomberg, did you interview any of the volunteers who worked for him on his campaign? Uh, and the reason I'm asking this question is because I volunteered to work for Mark Green. And Mayor Bloomberg was taking all of the volunteers from Mark Green because he was paying more money. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like the same pattern. He's paying more money, and people are running to his campaign. Did you have that experience? 
Well, I, I did interview people, especially back then, but you know, some of the people that, inter that were volunteers on, as you say, were volunteer. For example, I think uh, Bloomberg's chief speechwriter, Frank Berry, uh, had worked for Mark Green and he became, um, well, a speechwriter, communications director, and like that. I'm not sure how much Frank Barry would have been paid in the city, but but um, but 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 he, he's probably paid a lot now. Yeah, <laughs> it just seemed to be a pattern because my best friend, uh, she left Mark Green's campaign and she went to work for Bloomberg. And I, to this day, I won't speak to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Rachel? Hi. Um, one question I have for you, I know there's been some other uh, biographies of Bloomberg before this one. And I know one by Joyce Pernick, I uh, could tell you the other authors. But I wanted to know, uh, you know, you read those, and what what did you find was missing from those? Or what does your biography, what theory does it offer that's missing from those? Or oh, what got... You what, would know somebody who works with Mitchell would ask a question yeah. like that. <laughs> that's a tough one. Okay, look, there are several other books about uh, Bloomberg out there. There is Joyce Pernick's biography, which was published um, in 2009. And it's it's a good... The thing that is missing from my biography that she had, she had access to Bloomberg's mother who died before I really started working on it and, um, and a few people like that. Several people I tried to get in touch with in Medford had, uh, you know, met their maker before I could actually get them on the phone. So, um, so she had that advantage. Um, uh, her, her book was, um, you know, ended in 2009, and and I had the advantage of going to 2019. So, so there was a lot of Bloomberg, with all those hours that he, you know, that he won't allow to be empty. I had a lot of extra stuff to write about. Um, Bloomberg wrote his own autobiography. It's of course, you know, he's such a shy man it's called bloomberg by bloomberg and so he wrote it and it's it's really the original one was written while he was running while he was running the company and it's really interesting actually he redid it for the campaign and same that, title same title but not as interesting frankly and so so that one is out there and it's um the, the original one is, is telling in a lot of ways, but the new one is, is very carefully, you know, sanitized. And <clears throat> so um, those, were the, those are the big ones. Um, a guy named Chris McNichol wrote a really good analysis of, of Bloomberg as mayor. Well, I think first of all, you know, I think that the, the one by Pernick really captures the very early part of the years. And I think Eleanor goes, I think, much more into the actual mayoralty. There was a question back there? Yes. Hi, I'm Josh. I work in affordable housing. And <laughs> so I think it was always very interesting during the campaign, all of his commercials saying how he preserved all these affordable units. Preserved is the real key. Yeah, preserved, but that's a whole other bag of worms. Um, but during his tenure, inequality in New York had never been greater to a certain degree, and here we are now. And so I guess, like, for a man who really doesn't have to answer to anyone, I'm just curious. I mean, he just spent $600 million on a campaign that was like pocket change. Um, you know, to what degree does he really try to be cognizant of working class people? Like, how does he really factor them into his equation? I mean, he claims to be running on behalf of them, but does he really empathize with them, as he says? Well, you know, uh, as I said before, He's an engineer, and he is not, um, you know, he's not warm and fuzzy. There is none of that, you know. I mean, he is, uh, he's, he's fascinating, he's super smart, and he looks at the world. Um, I saw, there was an interesting piece about his girlfriend, Diana Taylor, 
who said that she asks him, you know, she's got a problem, she wants to talk to him, and he he listens to the problem, and he, and I don't know, um, I have the same problem with my husband, but he, but Bloomberg just says, okay, how can we fix it? And um, I don't know about Diana, but I really want to talk about the problem some more, you know, I want to sort of schmooze a bit. Are there other people who know this? Anyway, so uh, as for the working people, you know, he, he um, so he comes from that uh, milieu. His father was an accountant. They, his father made, uh, sometimes he says $6,000 a year, sometimes 9000 Back then, 9000 would have been a good salary, actually, but <clears throat> his father was still working pretty much working class. So he, <clears throat> I mean, what you often get from him is the thought that the way you succeed um, is to have a good, have a job and a good education, not in that order, a good education and a job. So you guys are on your way here from at NYU, of course. Um, so, so th that is, you know, he didn't, it's, it's, the system is often called uh, <clears throat> a hand up instead of a hand out. And that, he sort of fell into that category of politicians. Um, I think he said he, he created a lot of housing um, and preserved a lot of housing. I think he, the number was 200,000. I, I can't tell you whether that's true or not. Um, I know that I that you could see a lot of housing going up around the city, a lot of housing going up for super millionaires along 57th Street. Um, and in fact, people come to me all the time and say, I liked Mike Bloomberg, but I hate those big tall buildings on 57th Street. <laughs> uh, you know, they were all as of right, if you probably uh, have lived with that. And um, so, um, and as Bloomberg often said, and his, his uh, planning and development people often said, New York, in New York, there's only one way to grow, and that's up. So, so I just want to say, I think in response to your question, the question was, how does someone that wealthy empathize with the working but I think New York has a long tradition of very wealthy people who decide to take on the uh, persona. So actually the most housing ever built by a governor was Nelson Rockefeller, who built Co-op City and uh, out in Brooklyn, a huge amount of Spring Creek. I think you'd find out that uh, he actually was the governor when they created the Urban Development Corporation to build low-income housing. And so I, I think the pedigree of the person doesn't necessarily predict what they're going to do in policy making. I really think, uh, you know, that I wish it did, but I don't think, you know, the, the, I, from a presidential viewpoint, the only president after you was poor in recent past 80 years was Lyndon Baines Johnson. And he actually did the most for people who were poor of any person. And I think anyone looks back and where he came from, he was truly coming from poverty. I don't think we've had anyone else ever move, you know, certainly we've had, a, you know, the Democrats pick a lot of millionaires to run, you know, John Kerry, you know, they have a long history. He, you know, it's very funny, but then none of the people running on the Democrat side are poor. And um, by any, you know, they may not be Bill well. Clinton. Bill Clinton started poor, yes. I think, yes. And I think that would be um, much, I think he gained his wealth after his White House. Most get it beforehand. Let me go in the back. Anybody on that side? Yes. Do you have a question back? Yes. I thought that Bloomberg's father was a complete <laughs> That's a very important professional distinction. I think you're right. I think that's accurate. Yes. Hi, I'm Zirnab. I'm a student here at Wagner. So obviously stop and frisk gets talked about a lot, obviously. But something, one, one of his policies that we don't see talked about on the debate stage or in any of his interactions with the media is the unwarranted surveillance of Muslim communities in mosques and various restaurants and clubs and coffee shops and so on and so forth. I personally know one of my TAs here at NYU 
went through that surveillance process and we later found out it was very traumatizing for him. So why do you think he gets a pass on that? I don't know if you talked about it in your book, but why do you feel he gets a pass on such Islamophobic policies and this unwarranted surveillance and he hasn't had to apologize for it, rather he goes on justifying it by saying that he supported the building of a mosque at Ground Zero and so on? Well, you know, he was asked about this on several occasions and he basically said what uh, Kelly said, which is that, I mean, Kelly created this, it was sort of a, a New York version of the CIA because they didn't, they didn't really trust Washington. And so they, um, they, they went out and followed people. And so Bloomberg and Kelly both said, Kelly said it most directly. He said, I would follow people in St. Patrick's if I thought I was worried about them. And, and so that was his reaction to that. Um, there were, clearly there were many people who felt quite aggrieved by that policy. And um, the one thing I can say, I mean, um, is that, uh, okay, Bloomberg is a terrible speaker. We all know that. But he gave one truly great speech when he was uh, mayor. And that was in 2010 when <clears throat> there was a discussion about putting um, an Islamic center down near the World Trade Center. And uh, Newt Gingrich came after him and um, his, his friends in the Jewish community came after him, everybody came after him, and he went to Governor's Island and he gave a speech which basic, basically said, this is America, if, uh, if, uh, the, the, if this group of people want an Islamic center at that site, they should be able to, ha be able to build it and to create it. And um, it was an important speech I don't know that the Islamic Center was ever built in the way he wanted. I don't think it ever ever uh, materialized. But but what he was saying was that you know this is America and and we where we have to make room for all the different religions. So um, even th so, th you find this with I think you find this with all really good politicians. You you will, they're never totally good or to totally bad. Now, just as I said that, I was thinking about the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway. We have a question. Yeah. I have a question if no one else does. I want other, everyone else to ask first. Well, you have a right. You go first. Yes. Okay. Can I? Oh. Yes. All right. Uh oh, the dean. Oof. You covered Bloomberg, and early in your career, you covered Jimmy Carter, right? Mm -hmm. So, being mayor of New York is a lot different from being president. When when you think about Bloomberg as mayor, and you think about Carter as president, do you think Bloomberg would have been a great president? You know, I think he would be a really good president. One of the things that would happen was that it would be quiet. You know, and uh, the um, you know, he's kind of even when, as mayor, he came out and talked to the press all the time. You know, and he was boring most of the time. And I don't know about you, but I'm sort of desperate for boring. And so that that was a part of sort of how I thought about how he would run run the country. But the other part of it is that he is very goal oriented. He um, is, the first thing that he did when he became mayor and the most important thing he did was to hire the best people who would work for him and work super, super hard for him because, uh, and I have to say that people loved working for this guy. I, you know, um, they had their, they weren't cell phones. Blackberries. Blackberries back then, and they buzzed all the time. There was, you know, it was 24-7 for everybody who worked for him. But, but people really liked working for him, and so you wouldn't have, you know, three defense secretaries in three years, that kind of thing. He would, 
that would have been. I also think <coughs> that, and I mentioned this earlier, he has learned from his mistakes. You know, he's, um, <coughs> my editor, Alice uh, Mayhew, said when she read this book, she said, you know, this guy has gotten better with age. And I think that's right. I think he, he um, you either do that or you get, you know, hardened in the, in the fourth grade like somebody we know. And <laughs> so <coughs> he, it would be, I think it would be a very stable presidency. It would be, uh, it, the press would hate it. They won't, they won't say that, but they would hate it because this has been as terrible as Trump is for most of the rest of us who try to get a good night's sleep. Uh, he's been great for the press, you know. I mean, he is, uh, he is a super big news story every day. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I think Bloomberg would not be so good for the press. Well, I think the big difference is when one comment was the difference between Carter and Bloomberg. I think that the New York City Oh, yeah, City I forgot mayor, to talk about that. New York City has designed the mayor to be the center of authority in the city and vast amount of powers. So he was a very activist mayor. You know, he was land use, certainly very aggressive on, you know, uh, you know, issues that rarely ever involve a mayor, like public health. And banning smoking was viewed as something that was just ridiculous in New York. The cigarette never happened. It would it, never happen. Yeah, Everybody nobody, told us no that. No bar. Was, they were protesting <laughs> restaurants and bars. Then he said, "Is he going to have Starbucks tell you the calories?" Then he went overboard on transfer. And then, of course, he finally found that Coca Cola is just bigger than he is, and he tried <laughs> to get them to stop selling. Coca Cola was not letting New York City touch sugar. They had already bought the Harvard Health Publishing by the researchers to show that it was. Obesity and not sugar that caused health problems, and they were not going to let New York City go after sugar. He well, said, how's that different from Carter? The, well, the point is that Bloomberg <laughs> went after the big enemies. Smoke, American tobacco, I think, is, took a loss here, and then 50 countries, even Ireland, banned smoking. So, you know, not drinking, but smoking. So I would say <laughs> that uh, if he Ooh. were president, you would see a much greater. Uh, I think that, uh, let's put it this way. There's no doubt in my mind he would handle this virus differently than the current president. Oh, and oh. I think that you know we would have a far more re consistent kind of public health agenda. Uh, he actually is a zealot on public health compared to any other mayor. I think it was a change. I think the other part is you know I think New York has did longer, three years longer than the national average. We can't he, give him he credit. Says, he, he always says just before you die, if you're a New Yorker, remember you got three extra years. Right. <laughs> I, I'm hoping I'll think about something yeah. else. <laughs> so the, I think it's the activism would have been a real change. Let's get, are there any, yes, you've been patient Sorry, in the front row. Yeah, so I'm Robbie. I'm an undergraduate uh, at NYU. And, and I was wondering, talking about, uh, you know, his run for president, you know, besides the fact that he'd always want to do it, why do you think he decided to do it when he did, um, despite obviously telling you that, that he, uh, he didn't he want to? He wasn't going to do yeah. it. Um, well, you know, um, what I've learned since, since he decided to run was that he and his pollsters, he has pretty good pollsters, were looking at what we call the blue wall, all those states that the uh, Democrats should have won in 2016 and didn't, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, Arizona. Um, and so um, they saw Trump winning in these states, and they saw Biden failing. And so uh, Bloomberg saw a path, in a, a, a center, you know, path for himself. And so he got into the race, and um, as we know, um, he, he spent, you know, for us, a ton of money for him pocket change and it, um, it it went nowhere he got 56 delegates isn't that right and so um, I mean what happened that was really ex I've never seen this in politics before and it was I was really sorry I didn't have a newspaper to write for because 
when th the South Carolina uh, vote and uh, when uh, Congressman Clyburn came out and endorsed Biden, that was such a huge event. I, I haven't seen anything quite like that in politics because suddenly, you know, Joe Biden, um, <laughs> the MSNBC used the New York Times video when uh, Joe Biden, they kept asking him, you know, you're dead, aren't you? I mean, why are you even trying to do this? And Biden said, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, you know? And so he was, then he really was alive. So at that point, I was surprised, I couldn't figure out exactly when Bloomberg was gonna get out, but it became obvious he was gonna get out. Now, what's interesting is what happens now. And um, does anybody want to know? Okay. This Eleanor, by the way, has gone to have a new edition coming out in the fall. So <laughs> another it life. It's a you know fifth life. Or it won't be about President Bloomberg, but it'll be about the would be effort of President. Bloomberg. Yeah, that's right. So you know when uh, when he decided in in March that he wasn't going to run, his people told me that even if he didn't run, he was going to do everything in his power to defeat Donald Trump. And so uh, that is still true. So w all those ads, many of those ads, there, some of them obviously talk about Bloomberg. But if you look at many of them, the first half are, um, those are, are you know, anti-Trump ads. And in some ways you can just lop off the ending and you know, say paid for by Bloomberg PAC or whatever they're gonna decide to call that. But they're gonna set up this alternative uh, political force. Um, they, they have a digital uh, group called Hawkfish and I don't know what a hawkfish is. I've tried to look this up. It looks like just an ordinary fish. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but anyway, so it's called hawkfish. And um, apparently, you know, Bloomberg has these big aquariums or aquaria. In, uh, in all of his offices and you know they were in City Hall and apparently there was a hawkfish in there and they decided that that was a cool name. Um, anyway, that group is going to try to compete with Trump in the, in the digital world and as almost everybody in the political sphere knows, um, Trump, he can't run the White House, but he's got a terrific political campaign for re-election. He isn't abetted by Vladimir Putin. <laughs> oh yeah, Putin has been busy helping him and I'm afraid Bernie Sanders at this point. But, um, but, uh, but Bloomberg wants, to, the Democrats really don't have that kind of expertise. Bloomberg runs a company, a digital company with 20,000 people in it. It's all about the terminal and, you know, um, analytics and you name it. And so they are, they are supposed to provide a lot of that expertise to the Democrats who don't really have the money, the time, or the, or the knowledge necessary to do that. And if they do that, that will be a very important um, a contribution to the 2020 election. We have time for one or two questions. Come over on to you. Yes. I was just wondering um, if there was something that stood out to you as the most. Didn't you already ask a question? Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> The last one was hard. I hope this was this easier. One, this one's more fun, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the most surprising or unexpected thing you learned in your research, what's the thing we don't know about Mike Bloomberg? That I don't know now? No, that you found out. What was the that thing we, that you were that like, you excited know. to tell people about? Well, that's one of the things I said earlier, is that he has a really uh, interesting and sort of tough sense of humor. I, uh, should I tell this? No. So anyway, uh, in one of my interviews with him, I said to him, you know, I'm almost as old as you are. And he said, 
well, how old are you? And I said, I'm 76. And he said, really? You don't look a day over 75. <laughs> and that, that's, you know, you live with that kind of thing. But I, I, found, I found that kind of humor um, and the way the people, uh, uh, I mean, look, he pays his people a lot of money but they also really like working for him. I've been surprised at that. I thought it was just the money, frankly, when I first started looking at uh, who he was and how he operated, but it isn't. I mean, some of those people can get jobs elsewhere. There was one more question. I've been waiting for that question. Well, you know, I was. Well, you, uh, I was part of the army of people who were shocked to see him in that first debate. I mean, he was dreadful. There's no other word for it. And, I mean, part of it is maybe if he'd started earlier, he could have debated. I mean. Biden wa wasn't always good in those debates, as you know. But, uh, but I had never, I mean, first of all, Bloomberg is not a, uh, a good debater. I mean, I, he, he, he was okay debating Mark Green and um, Bill Thompson. I mean, he was just, he was okay, but he's not great. And there were some great debaters on that stage, as you know. So he was definitely outclassed in the debate. Uh, the other thing is all the ads showed this powerful, you know, get it done person. And suddenly you saw a Bloomberg who got sort of poked in the nose by Elizabeth Warren and he, he didn't seem to have a comeback. And uh, none of us really can understand why he didn't. Some people said he had too many people giving him too much advice. That kind of makes sense. I also think he didn't want to attack Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and so he, he, he really wanted to attack Bernie Sanders. That's probably, and he, in the second debate, he actually finally did that. But I don't, uh, I would, I would not choose him for my debate team. <laughs> well, Chris, I want to thank you. But, Ellen, that's a great answer. I want it's 6.30. I don't want to keep everyone longer. I just want to thank Eleanor for giving us this chance. And I know if you have questions, we'd love to talk to her. And I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you.